This is part three in our series of lectures on section 4.2 involving the construction of functions. And in this lecture, we're going to talk about the relation between inverse functions, composition of functions, and the identity function. Here's the definition of the identity function on a set. If A is any set, then the function which we denote by I sub A, known as the identity function on A, is defined to be the function from A to A, which sends each x to itself. Recall that we've defined the identity relation on a set in exactly this way, and um, we're just observing here that in fact it's really a function. So our intention in this lecture is to prove the following result. If A and B are any two sets, and F is a function from A to B, and uh, if we know that f inverse exists as a function, so it would be a function from b to a, then when you take the composition in the order f inverse composed with f, you get the identity on b, and if you take it in the opposite order, you get the identity on a. In order to prove this result, we're going to make use of two other results that we've seen in recent lectures. Let me recall those two results for you. The first one says that if we have two functions, um, one function from A to B and another function from B to C, then when you take the composition, F composed with G, then you always get a function from A to C, and for each X in A, um, this is the value, the value of the function at that x is given by this expression here. The other theorem tells us how we can know when two functions are equal. So they're equal if and only if they have the same domains. And for every x in that common domain, the values of the function agree. So these were both results that we saw in earlier lectures. So now we're going to get back to the result that we want to prove here. If A and B are any two sets, F is a function from A to B, and assuming that F inverse is really a function, so that would mean that it was a function from B into A, then we have these two formulas connecting the compositions of the one function with its inverse. So I'm only going to do the proof of the first one for you. And the proof of the second one is similar, and I'll, I'll leave that to you as an exercise. Now, one could prove this from first principles, just by proving that the set defining this is equal to the set defining this. Um, but it's a little bit simpler if we make use of the above two theorems. So why don't you put your video on hold, on pause, and see if you can write up a formal proof of this theorem here. And when you come back, I'll show you my proof. So here's my proof. Um, so we're going to begin by applying theorem 1. Um, but the notation, uh, I hope, doesn't confuse you. Don't get hung up on the names of these things. The A, the B, and the C are going to be different when we actually apply them. So the way to read this theorem 1 is just simply that you have the composition of two functions, um, one from A to B and then the other from B to C, so from one set to another and then from that set to still another set, um, and this is telling you that when you take the composition that that's really a function from the first set to the third set, and so in particular the domain of that function is the very first set, and the second formula tells you what the um, what the value of the function is at a given point in the domain. So since f inverse is assumed to be a function from b into a, um, it follows from, from theorem 1 that f inverse composed with f is a function from b into b, and in particular its domain is b. And also from the definition, it's perfectly clear that the domain of the identity function on B is also B. So we have these two functions. 
this one and this one, and they their the domains do in fact agree. Now we just have to prove that for every element y of b, the values of those two functions also agree. So let's take an element y of b, and I'm going to define for convenience the element x in a given by f inverse of y. I can do that because I've assumed that f inverse is actually a function. So now let's just uh, observe that if we view f inverse as a relation, saying that this is the case is to say that y comma x is an element of that relation, and so by definition of f inverse that means when you reverse the order you get an element of f. But f is a function, and so this says nothing more then y is equal to f of x. So now we can calculate the value of f inverse composed with f at y by again applying theorem 1. Theorem 1 guarantees that it's equal to this, but f inverse of y is x and f of x is y by this. So that gives us the value of f inverse composed with f at y, it's y, and by definition, of course, the identity function on b at y is equal to y. So, these two functions have the same value at each point of their domain, and they have the same domains, and so by theorem 2, they're equal as functions. And that completes the proof.